everybody. Um, good afternoon and welcome to um, today's panel discussion. Um, we're going to kick off with a short clip um, and then I will introduce the panel to you. Um, and also we will discuss the key issues around digitizing culture. So uh, let me just make sure I'm all set to go. Um, obviously, we're really excited to have um, you join us this afternoon. It's really, it's a really pertinent and interesting conversation, I think, to have with everything that's actually happening, um, the things that are taking place, not just locally, but I think even across the globe as well. Um, so if you give me one minute, I shall just share my screen. So I hope that's been able to set the tone for this afternoon's conversation. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Oinda Molafake, and I am the moderator for today, to this afternoon's conversation around digitizing cultural heritage. Um, I'm very fortunate to be joined uh, by an array of, you know, really accomplished um, speakers, um, and you know, just to really get to know. Um, from their own perspective, you know, what digitizing cultural heritage really means. Um, so I'm just going to start by introducing the panel, uh, and I'll start with Uchenna Okia. Um, and Uchenna is a self-taught interaction designer and the head honcho at Gossaman, a computer arts company that specializes in game design, photo gametry, um, and 3D printing. He was introduced to game developments by some friends who had, but he's improved his computer art skills since then through YouTube videos and other related websites. He's a graduate of computer science and management uh, and a Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology alumni. So welcome to our panel, Uchenna Okoya. Um, Hi also, guys. <laughs> thank you. I'd also like to welcome Kwelu Awofeso. Um, and Felu is a writer and researcher based in Lagos and a winner of the CNN Multi-Choice African Journalist Award. He's the author of five books. He writes mostly about the arts, culture, and travel. So welcome, Felu. Thanks, Renita. Good afternoon, everybody on the panel. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm also joined by um, Jumake Sonwo, who is a visual storyteller and cultural interlocutor. <laughs> from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, she's an artist. She works primarily in photography, video art, and virtual reality. Her conceptual framework and processes are largely informed by global localization or global with a local approach to in engagement and storytelling, uh, where the individual's culture, histories, and traditions are presented as independent frames within the global picture. So welcome, Jamaka. It's a pleasure to be here, Onita. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. And I'm also, Hi. thank you so much. Thanks. I'm also joined by Frederica Morshell, um, who is the director of the Goethe Institute here in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, Frederica was born in Munich, Germany, and studied in Heidelberg and Cologne, where she studied German and English literature. Um, after university, she lived in Beijing, Hamburg, and Cairo. Um, since 2007, she's worked with the Goethe Institute, um, the Cultural Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany, and has been posted to UAE, Uzbekistan, Ukraine. And since July 2017, she has been the director of the Goethe Institute here in Lagos and enjoys the amazing cultural scene in the city. So welcome. Hello, everyone. Hi. So um, I think the first things first is um, I'd really love to just go around the room and really get an idea of what a definition, I guess, of what digital um, digitizing culture means to you uh, and in your practice. Um, so I'm going to start with Frederica, as she was the last person I introduced, um, and then um, uh, I will go around. Well, yes, thank you. So I think... Um... Digitalizing culture provides huge uh, possibilities. I mean, also at our institution, the Goethe Institute, we started some years ago to discuss this topic, how you can use VR and AR, etc., for cultural uh, uh, events, projects, and of course, when it's about cultural heritage. 
So I see uh, huge advantages, especially when it's about archiving, when it's about uh, having a kind of digitalized memory. And um, what I also love about it is that it makes uh, things available for everyone globally, uh, which usually people would probably not have heard about before. Let's say Nigeria is not a tourist spot so far. So uh, a lot of people can maybe tell you about the pyramids in Egypt and uh, uh, some temples in, in India. But when it's about uh, uh, cultural historical sites in Nigeria, I think it's mainly an expert topic. So, so this gives the possibilities to uh, also inform the normal people uh, about uh, what's going on here. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go on to Ampelu and ask you what digitizing culture means for you. Yeah, thanks, Renuda. Um... So I think there are two ways that, that, that I could look at this. I could take the, the broad view and I could also take the narrow view. If I look at it from the broad perspective, digitizing means putting heritage in a format, you know, that's available for um, the future generations of scholars, or academics or knowledge seekers. So that what we, what we you know, um, what we inherited from the past and what we are currently seeing in the present can be made available to them in the future, even if we may not be there. If I take a narrow view, I'll look at the same, you know, the same, the same concepts being that making, you know, heritage, you know, part of everyday living, making it fit into um, everyday lifestyle, making it fit into the trends of the current generation. You know, because what, we, what, we've, what we've seen for many years is that um, our heritage has been locked up in the museums, in the archives. And the current generation, so long as they are not in the academics or in academia, or they're not journalists researching stories and stuff like that, they really don't have a, a care in the world for, for heritage. But if we were to put, put it into something that they see and they use on a daily basis, then heritage becomes very essential and a part of their everyday life. So that is taking the narrow view. Okay, so I mean, when you look at that same topic, it is the reason why over the lockdown period, I was able to visit museums from around the world, just from my apartment in Lagos, because curators and researchers abroad have already seen the importance of making heritage a global heritage. It is not just something that should be for a particular environment. So I traveled all over the continent, I mean, all over the world, seeing museums that I may never, ever, ever, ever visit in my life. It is the same thing we need to begin to do. And I'm happy that this conversation is happening and I hope it gets to as many people as possible. And it's good that the gaming industry is paying attention to, to the subject of digitizing culture and heritage. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go on to Jumoke. Thank you so much, Oida. I think uh, for me, um, I'm looking at digitizing uh, as a, a means to actually acquire, you know, process and, and, and theorize uh, data, uh, you know, that is of um, what a society has de decided to be a selection of the expressions. Uh, and those expressions could be artistic expressions. Uh, it could also be in terms of tangible uh, and intangible aspects of uh, what is deemed as a cultural heritage. Um, and personally, I think within our local context, you know, when you look at it, I think we have more um, of our heritage domiciled as intangible elements, you know. So when you think about that, you think about the uh, oral and sort of like folklore, you think about um, uh, things like performance, you know, you think about even the way that we tell our stories as well, you know, traditional, traditional storytelling. Uh, and also when you think about uh, cultural heritage, especially uh, in a country like Nigeria, uh, which we're not a monolithic sort of entity, you know, we have over 250 uh, ethnic groupings. Uh, and within those, you have sort of like different uh, elements of what I think a society uh, has decided to be a representation of the expressions. Uh, so I think that is, uh, in a way, my own uh, definition of what uh, digitizing uh, um, cultural heritage is. 
so much, so much, and I really appreciate the interesting, especially um, the intangible. Um, Uchenna? Hey, um, hi guys, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Sure, we can. Yes. Okay, so, yeah, for me, digitizing heritage, um, Okay, let me start. How I stumbled into digitizing heritage was at first as a game designer, I wanted to make games that attracted, that told our stories. And um, the way traditionally we got um, assets was you have to hire someone to make this stuff yourself. And because the modern artists like um, um, Mr. Pelumi mentioned earlier, they didn't have access to, or most of them didn't have history and didn't know about these artifacts. It was hard to go online and find pictures that accurately represent these things. So I said to Seki, I can model these things how do we get them? Trying to, that, that, that research led me to the photogrammetry. And I said, okay, so I can capture my our, our traditional assets and make it digitally available. So I can we can use them digitally for games and tell our stories properly. So for me, digitizing culture is documenting, cataloging, and then capturing these physical assets that can that represent our history or our heritage in a way that can be accessible for people that will never ever walk into a museum or will not go and read any book for history. The kind of my group of friends, um, I only stumbled, stumbled into our history because I wanted to make a game that told our stories. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to make a game, if I wanted to make a game that told the stories for, which most of us do in the game design industry, tell, make first, first player games like for foreign com and countries, we don't bother about our history. So about playing games like God of War, that had to tell Greek mythology stories. And those people have a lot of money to hire people that can make those assets. They even still employ photogrammetry. So that is why for me, it's, it is simply cataloging our histories in a way that it saves time for we artists that want to use them in games and make it accessible for everybody else. And that way it represents our history, the way it looks, it was created by that artist that carved it out at, at the time, basically. Instead of trying to now copy it with software that will never be able to mimic the way the artist wanted to make that assets. So for me, it's just simply capturing that asset from the physical world and making it available for everybody else that wants to use it digitally and tell their stories properly represents the culture. Thank you so much. And I think so we can see that there's such a diversity within the digitization space, especially um, in terms of people's backgrounds um, and and spheres that they operate in, but you know, culture is so all-encompassing. You know, it really is about you know everyday life, and you know, all of us as well um, have a culture in, in, in which we exist in. Um, and I think sometimes people think that you know, the digitization is just for um, maybe cultural, you know, professionals. So you know, they might look at us and say, okay, that's what you're doing. But I think that there is a role for you know, the everyday person and the everyday person plays a role in, you know, digitizing um, cultural heritage, whether it's, you know, photo stories, um, even Instagram could be seen as a, a digitizing tool for, for cultural heritage. I just yesterday saw a picture of a Banksy, you know, um, in, a, in a city he's never been in. And, you know, all these images now come up um, and that is a way of capturing that. So what I'm, um, you know, what my next question really is, is why now and what's the opportunity? Um, I know for us who are based in Lagos, we know that we recently had the riots here um, and um, a lot, there was a lot of collateral damage be, um, because of that, including spaces being um, uh, ransacked and, you know, sites being uh, desolated. And, you know, it reminds me of a time in, in, in Mali when, you know, um, the Timbuktu was under attack, you know, and uh, so what does this, you know, what is the real opportunity and why now for digitization? Uh, and I'm going to throw that open to Jumoke first and then Frederica. Um, thank you very much. I think uh, looking at uh, the now and when we're thinking about now, thinking about what is ongoing um, at the moment in Nigeria, but not only in Nigeria, but also other countries as well, you know, um, regionally in Cameroon uh, and um, also internationally in countries like uh, the United States, you know, we've seen like this being like an upsurge in uh, civil uh, disturbances and also cases of arson and things like that. So there's a lot to look at when you're thinking about uh, the need to actually begin to think about where to put a lot of this 
um, elements uh, of cultural heritage. Uh, when, I'm th when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about um, uh, what do we do, for example, to think about cataloging, about documenting, uh, about, and then also what do we do about the intangible ones? For example, as you said, you know, everybody, when they think about uh, archiving, they always think about it as something that professionals have to do. But I look at archiving from a personal and also a collective perspective. Uh, on a personal pers perspective, we all have histories uh, and our histories are domiciled in our families, you know. And when you think about that, you think about how traditionally those histories were transferred through storytelling, uh, through, uh, um, from one generation to another. And then you also have, you know, the uh, photographic uh, documentation of family events and histories and how that is often transferred from one generation to another. So what happens now is that when you're thinking about that, uh, personal stories eventually become collective stories. Uh, and if you look at it from that perspective, we think about how, you know, in filling uh, the absences that we have in history, uh, and again, that is coming in our local context, when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about the fact that history hasn't been very important to us. We had a bit of dislocation through our colonial history, but then beyond that dislocation, there hasn't been an attempt to actually really decide, you know, what it is that we want to preserve uh, as a collective. And that collective element needs to be in terms of um, our groupings, you know, uh, and that grouping, when you think about groupings, you're thinking about uh, um, more like the communities, you know, and things like that. So I'm thinking about how we haven't quite decided what to keep. And that is the thing with history uh, uh, or, or preserving cultural heritage. It is not something that is static. People need to come together at varied points and, uh, and intersections in history and decide what parts of the expressions they want to keep. So I think now, uh, because of uh, recent occurrences across you know, the city of Lagos and also in other parts of Nigeria as well, there's a need to actually come together and begin to think about what aspects of history do we want to preserve. Uh, there's also been a bit of a tension uh, between um, uh, the perception of our traditional practices uh, in mainstream, you know, uh, it's been demonized, you know, to a certain degree. So people often don't have that direct connection with traditional practices. And that's also an element of our history as well. So how do we think about that? And how do we begin to actually mend that dislocation? When you think about shrines or think about, you know, places like Osho, Osho, Bogo, you know, people look at it as something very demonic. It is not something that they want to typically associate with. So how do we begin to educate the mass on the need for uh, a connection between our past uh, and our present? Because at the end of the day, when you look at it, you realize that that aspect of our history is, is very relevant to how we want to situate ourselves in the future. Because without that, we're just sort of like floating. Uh, we don't have an anchor, you know, in terms of, you know, what it is that we deem uh, is our history. So I think that's the start. The starting point is to come to an agreement of what it is that we want to preserve and to begin to think about ways to actually actively uh, you know, document those things. And that documentation needs to be done uh, personally, which is like an, uh, in terms of individuals, you know, documenting their own personal family histories, and also that feeding into some sort of collective collection or collation or repository of history. I'll hand on the floor of the team. So for me, there are two reasons why I think this discussion is uh, important to be uh, um, intensified right now. I mean, first of all, as you mentioned, uh, we uh, had all this uh, political developments over the past two, three weeks here with some tragic, tragic incidences. So this gives us, and as Jumoko said, uh, when you look at other countries, uh, what's going on, this to uh, uh, digitally uh, places which are important for our culture, for our history, for our identity. However, I think there is another very important reason. It's about the environmental uh, changes we face worldwide. I mean, you know, um, uh, weather is changing, uh, the water levels going up. So I think these are also reasons why we globally should be really aware of how we can at least 
if we not can protect it, but how we, can we archive certain things? And the other topic for me is about accessibility of gadgets. I think nowadays or over the last two, three, four years, um, most people have uh, uh, mobile phones, smartphones, uh, also the accessibility of uh, VR headsets is not that you have to pay thousands of dollars for it. So this kind of um, technical development has moved on quite a lot. So um, as, uh, as we already said before, it's not just about experts anymore, it's really about young people, middle-aged people who are just curious and uh, who want to use their time during lockdown or on a weekend just to explore culture in other countries and other parts of their own country. And uh, so therefore, I think it's really um, important now to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we are, you know, we're seeing, I think, more and more people um, like coming coming on board, of course, like the the um, international organizations like Goethe, you know, British Council, UNIC, um, are really um, interested in the, the archiving, the digitization process. But um, we're now seeing like younger people and younger collectives getting, you know, you know, getting more involved in this. And I know that recently you had the um, Hack Your Culture um, open call out. Could you speak a little bit more? To, to that project? To be really honest, as we have not been uh, part of the organization team here in Lagos, and as we just opened up our office uh, beginning of October until last week, I mean, you know, about, have heard about what happened. So uh, I'm not right in the position to give really a very uh, insightful uh, uh, information on uh, Hack Your Culture. Um, but I think it's uh, what Uchenna also mentioned before. I think it's really important to use um, channels which are uh, used by uh, younger people also in ways of entertainment. Yeah, so that you comp combine it and that you are not there and say, okay, now you have to uh, check the website of a museum and just look at the digital archive. To be honest, I mean, how of us would like to do it on a Saturday morning? Or uh, So if you can uh, compare combined with uh, entertainment, with games uh, uh, to create a VR setting or so where you can wander around and uh, see the ocean grow, something like this. Um, this is, I think, the right way to, to, uh, to continue. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that that actually segues into Jumoke's project that we just, um, that we started this um, afternoon session with. Um, so Jumoke, could you just speak a little bit more to how that project came about um, the kind of team that was needed to um, to to really um, ac action that kind of a project, uh, and then what's you know what's in store for that. Thank you very much, Alida. I think uh, that particular project was um, came about as a result of uh, prior uh, engagements that we've had in terms of uh, looking at a way to find an intersection between technology and the arts. Uh, it started, first of all, uh, with a collaborative effort between um, Revolving Art Incubator and Emisi 3D uh, as far back as 2017 with Samsung as well. Uh, and we had done uh, a two-day workshop, you know, where we tried to introduce uh, artists, you know, uh, to um, sort of like the possibilities of extended reality. So moving on from that particular workshop, we then organized a series of workshops last year as well. Uh, the first was... Um, introducing uh, archiving principles, uh, which we did in collaboration with uh, the Aga Khan Institute of MIT, uh, and then also with uh, our, our local partner, Emisi 3D, which is uh, uh, an extended reality lab in Lagos. And then we also connected with other local uh, cultural partners as well. And that's uh, um, Omenka Gallery, uh, as well as uh, Ashiri uh, Magazine as well, who was also part of that. So that, in a way, was like an introduction, and we had participants, you know, to which we had been carrying along um, since uh, 2017, and then we had sort of like something going on again in 2019, and then that eventually evolved to uh, the project that we did, uh, which, which was a collaborative project between Emisi 3D, uh, Adunio Lorisha Trust, uh, Nat Geo, Asayak, who was uh, like our main technical partner, um, and um, 
uh, and also Google Arts and Culture. So again, it, it shows that it really takes a village, you know, to embark, you know, on, on a project such as that. But also, it was very important that we were, we were concerned about um, uh, the deficit uh, in terms of uh, human capital to actually archive successfully locally. Uh, we had challenges, obviously, because the equipment to engage in photogrammetry uh, and also uh, Luda as well, uh, you know, was, was quite expensive. I mean, you're talking about equipment worth over 20, between the range of 20 to $50,000. Uh, so we thought that it was important to begin to uh, introduce, and we did introductory sort of like uh, uh, workshops, which is like to have participants even get introduced to the idea of archiving. Uh, we collaborated as well uh, with uh, Yaba, uh, Yaba Tech, where we did a lot of the practical elements. Um, also, because we want to begin to engage uh, uh, educational institutions on the possibility of introducing archiving uh, as uh, archiving and record management uh, uh, as a course, you know, to, to which then we can begin to build a local human capital. So I think that, that's like the starting point. It was like something that started, you know, but then has evolved into uh, the Austrian Shogun. So we had a four day uh, workshop uh, in Lagos uh, for 20 participants. Uh, and some of those participants were then uh, selected, uh, the people that did very well in the course of the workshop to then engage uh, with uh, the representatives of SIAC in Nigeria. Uh, that was Casey Haddick and uh, Avi Fernandez, uh, and they were the ones that came in to actually conduct uh, that. So again, we didn't want it to be like they were coming in and they were doing the project, but at the same time, we wanted them to actually also empower uh, and build local capacity as well. Uh, so we then went on uh, to then do the uh, digital conservation project in Shogo. Uh, and what we have done, just like Uchina said, was that on one hand, uh, we also saw the need to uh, start thinking about what to do with assets. So uh, NCMM, that's the National uh, Commission of Museum and Monuments, was also part of this project. Because we realized that not only do we have to think about uh, digitizing and also archiving, but we also have to think about authorship as well, and who gets to own all of these materials being created. So we ensured that NCMM was part of this. So at the end of the day, uh, all the material that we collated belongs to NCMM. Uh, we, you know, as uh, coordinators and participators uh, in the project, have the right of use for those assets, uh, to which we can then use to develop, you know, outcomes. You know, and that outcome we're still sort of like deliberating on on the very many ways that we can actually use it, uh, and 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 also how we can get that, you know, to. I mean, because we think about it, we have over 99 million internet users in Nigeria. So when you think about it from that perspective, we need to begin to think about how to engage you know, the audience in a way that we bring, we bridge the uh, information and I think knowledge gap uh, in the country. Uh, yeah, and no, I think I'll just speak to, um, just invite Felu to just, um, I, I, or I don't know, I know you fell off the call. I hope you, uh, yeah. okay. Um, I just, um, you know, really in terms of that information and knowledge gap space, um, as a journalist, um, you know, how are you utilizing this, um, the digitization um, mediums? Um, are you, I mean, is, are you sticking to the traditional or, you know, how, how are you really going about it, especially in within your um, sphere of the tourism, um, the arts? at all. Okay, yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah, I went off briefly, um, internet issues. Um, so the thing is, um, you know, good enough, Frederica mentioned about VR and AR, you know, um, in, a, in, in, my, in an earlier answer. That's something that I'm still going to come to what I do with, with journalism. But because I also play a lot more in the tourism space, I'm aware that a couple of um, people are going all out to digitize our tourist attractions especially the culturally heavy ones by way of virtual reality. You know, I've seen the, I actually, be, I was part of the effort at the beginning and I'm still a part of it. So we have a couple of individuals, a team of people visit some of these heritage sites, you know, Obunike Cave, um, Olumo Rock Complex, um, a, a couple of them like that scattered around the country, you know, and then we have them, you know, on VR whereby 
people can actually now use these VR machines, you know, to explore these, you know, cultural assets, which they may not really be able to travel to, you know, physically. For whatever reason, people just have not been able to um, um, motivate themselves enough to take a trip around Nigeria, either because they feel the roads are not too good enough, are not good enough, or they really can't afford to travel. So by using the platform of a VR, you know, we're able to bring those attractions close to them. That is on the level of tourism. You know, um, as a journalist, I haven't personally been, you know, migrating towards the digital yet, but I mean, I use it a lot of time to report. Okay, so what I try to do with my journalism is advocate actually for these sites. I think the, that, that, that's for me is a low hanging fruit. I can use my writing, my travels, and my platform to advocate for a proper preservation of these sites. For example, I'll give you a very, um, a very strong example. You know, I go to JOS a lot. I know a lot about JOS. You know, um, as 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 a, as as a, as, a, as a place of tourism, and there's a particular structure there called museums. Museum, Museum of Traditional Nigerian Architecture, MOTNA, M-O-T-N-A. It is a collection of 52 life-size architectural buildings, okay, representing the vernacular architecture from different parts of the country. Just imagine that 52 of them life-size. It was conceived to be 52, but I think they were not able to put the 52 together. So what we have is like maybe like about 14 or 15 of them, you know, in that space inside the Just National Museum. Believe me, from the, from the moment when it was conceived and up until now, the structures have continued to degenerate and deteriorate. So that when you get to that place right now, it's, a, it, 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 it's, an, it's an eyesore. It, it breaks my heart to actually go to Motna and see what a fascinating, a fascinating agenda, a fascinating cultural, you know, cultural project has become. Basically, because we haven't paid so much attention to these things, so Im imagine if what um, if what Jumoke and team and of course in partnership with the end. Funny enough, this Motna, it's under the purview of the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. So imagine if we could transfer the same skills and um, and um, and commitment that we saw you and your team you know put together in Osho Shobu take it to Motna and document digitally all the structures that are actually presently existing in Motna and then even you know, extend it to the other structures. You can imagine how many people, you will, you will fall in love with Nigerian architecture if you visit Motna, but it is not what it should be right now. So basically what I've actually spent most of the past how many years of journalism doing is advocating for everything Nigerian heritage, okay? It then becomes, I mean, so if I'm going to take it a step further and begin to get involved in digitization, it means I need funding. Okay, I also need to work with other experts. That is not something I can do at the moment, but I think as a journalist, the best I can do is to advocate. Okay, and there's also, last, just in September, I was at um, a place called Imesile. Imesile is, um, if you know a little bit about Yoruba history, you will know about the Kiriji War. So the Kiriji War was fought for several years and then sometime 134 years ago they came to a truce the warring parties came to a truce you know moderated by the colonial masters at the time so there are actually dozens of historical sites you know um theater of war where they fought the war you know landmarks where the armies actually stayed where they control the armies from all of these sites are scattered in the mesile and okay messy believe me they, they are rotting away they're just they're just getting bad by the day you know, because of the forces of the weather and all of that. And I got to this place, I'm like, why would we allow such a thing to, you know, so I came back, as a matter of what I was there, I didn't even get back to Lagos. Right from the spot, I began to do videos and began to do live reports on social media. It got quite a bit of traction, you know? So it's basically for me, advocacy. We need to advocate more for these sites, you know, and then try to hold the government accountable because I mean, there are, there are, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of assets all over this country locked up primarily in the hands of civil servants who have not been able to actually scale to the point where they can appreciate digitizing or the digital technology are available for us to actually you know preserve this, 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 this assets because if you, if, if you go to the, the typical nigerian museum the way the the objects are still presented it leaves much to be desired 
I mean, we're in the 21st century where if you go to a standard museum, you know, in a, in, in a country that appreciates what it's supposed to be, you are, you are seeing interactive displays, okay? There is no Nigerian museum that has an interactive display. What you have are labels being placed by the objects in paper, in ink, in black and white. And then um, you, you just know that something is not right somewhere. So we, we just have to keep on advocating. We have to keep on piling the pressure. We have to hope that we have more culturally um, motivated or inspired institutions like the Gote Institute, like other you know, cultural institutions, supporting the work of helping us to digitize our you know, nat national. And there are so many, like there are so many I, I keep on advocating for you know, all over the country. You know, there's, there's a national theater right there. If you look at the National Theater, what you see on the outside is not, is not all there is to the National Theater. There is way more going on inside that have been shut off, that, I mean, that the public cannot even assess because for whatever reason, we, we, we just choose to shut them off. So if you get into the National, if you actually read a bit about the National Theater and you see all of the components of the National Theater, you will wait for Nigeria actually. There's so much, there's so much, there's so much arts, there's so much, you know, there's so much that has been put into the National Theater at conception, but the public has no idea right now, because what we just do is we just see it as that beautiful, attractive structure that we all pass by and then we drive around. You need to go in, you need to actually get it. You need to actually see what it's made up of. And then on the outside, you'll see this rim of artistic impressions around, you know, the, the facade of the National Theater. There's a lot of story going on there, put up by Emokwai, and nobody is actually paying attention to those stories. We are, not, we are not digitizing those stories enough to even explain to the average visitor what those stories are, are all about. It goes around the entire structure. So I see all of these things, the little and the best I can do, just put them on, on platforms and advocate for them to be properly you know, um, preserved. And we, 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 need, we need to just do a lot more education. If our younger people were educated, or if they had young educated people among them, they won't they won't they won't they won't loot the, the city hall, you know, where you know where the Gothe Institute is. I was heartbroken when I heard that that place had been touched. Why would any reasonable young person, because you're angry, you don't you then go and touch a building that has been there for hundreds, I mean for for decades? It's 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 miseducation and it's something we need to get right. All right. So I'm not, I mean, I hope I've been able to answer a yeah. little bit of the question. Thank you so much, Belua. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I think that, you know, you know, having access and digitization, we know a lot of culture has been removed from our education system, right? So people are accessing it through other means. And, you know, Jumoke, you know, alluded to the fact that, you know, phones, we have, you know, millions of users so culture needs to be in people's hands right mm -hmm. um and um so it, it's funny what you what you say because i truly have never been inside um the national theater i, I have just been like admired <laughs> so, you need you know, to go inside you yeah you, you yeah you will be blown sure. away anybody will be blown away by that thing <laughs> yeah. um you know what's interesting and, and i'm gonna just you know just come to you Ochenna here is uh, around actually the process of digitization um, and the interaction and you know this is it's about the people and then their work right um, I know that you did a project for get around gaming where you were trying to um, is it photo gamery gametry where you uh, were digitizing people's works and tell me about the you know the kind of the relationships that you had to form um, and how people were people suspect of you know the process of it I'd really love to hear from your perspective Okay, um, um, so like for me, I I knew I won't have access to museums, you know, to the artifacts I was looking for. You know, I'm just a guy, just one man, and I tried the museum like 2015, and I had the, I was told I had to go to Ibadan, speak to one man. So I just <laughs> I just got tired, you know. So I said, you know what? So there are a lot of artisans on the streets doing amazing works, roadsides, and I realized that's work of art too, and and most times. They tell the stories of that particular location in a, in a way you you just look at it and you feel you you feel like this is this is my this is our stuff you know so I said why don't I focus on the everyday artisan why don't I just try and digitize the work so that's issue like you said was they were suspicious of me because people will come and take pictures of their work and sell it and they didn't get any credit at the time I was trying to make an archive for Nigerian game developers to have something they can access and use to make games and tell stories and give credit back to whoever 
had the artifacts. And I realized that these artisans, these sculptors, first of all, the, the job was dying out because they had no, they were losing, there was no, they weren't getting the kind of um, it, uh, rewards they were expecting. Yeah, and the trend had moved from sculpting to painting. So more, there were less sculptors than and more painters. So, and I needed more sculptors. So I said, you know what, I will digitize your work. And for every time it sells on my platform, you get some part of that money. And he was like, why, why do I need that? I said, because if you can only sell one sculptor once, you can sculpture once, you can make one sculpture. And if you can make 20 of them, it's stressful. But I can always resell your digital asset 10 million times to more people globally and you see the money forever. No matter, even if you sell the original work away, you still have that digital asset online selling for you. That opened me to realize that how much of, um, how do I put it, um, of how much technology can help these artists get more from their work than they normally get right now. So I don't approach organizations anymore because of the bureaucracy, you have to talk to somebody, come with letters. And as a creative person, you know you get tired because ideas are just in your head. It, it, it doesn't stay long. If somebody wastes your time, you move on to something else. So that's just one side. And then I realized that I was the only one talking about photogrammetry. It sounded like this big thing that people had to do in NASA. So I said, let me train other people about it too. I would tell people photogrammetry and they were like, you know, they would be like, sorry. Sorry, hold on, my battery. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Okay. Video, video is off, but we can hear you. I think I have to put off my camera. One second, please. Um, where's my camera? I really love the idea about um, digitization being an income and revenue stream, um, especially for traditional art makers as well. You know, I mean, I think more contemporary artists are leveraging the digital um, in terms of creating revenue, but it is, you know, those people that artisans, the crafters um, that haven't really been able to um, uh, operate within that digital space. So I think that's what I really found fascinating about, you know, the work that you did. And, and, and you know, of course it is there's that suspect, you know, and I don't know if you're back, Uchina, but, you know, when, when you do come back, I, I would love to hear about, you know, how maybe they felt in terms of getting that payment, like having payment coming from you. And, oh, I think you might have gone off yet. So, I mean, I think it would be interesting that process of um, royalties, I guess that's, that's how we would understand it. Uh, um, and understanding royalties as somebody who's working just as a traditional carver um, in, you know, a, a small community. So yeah, Jumoke, I was actually gonna ask you like, um, in terms of the Ashoka community, were there, you know, traditional carvers there or um, art makers and how did they feel about, you know, that, was there an opportunity for this process that you were working with them also becoming an income generating um, model for them? And I throw that to you, Jumoke. Sorry, Oinde, I think I lost my audio a little bit. So do you mind repeating that? Yeah. Oh, Thank you. Oh, Uchenna might, might actually be back. But I was just saying that how can this, um, in terms Sorry. of revenue generating, welcome back. So I, I, was, yeah. I was speaking about just um, how interesting it is that this is now an opportunity for revenue for um, traditional um, art makers. Uh, and so I just asked Jumoke that even in Oshogbo Grove, had they thought about really the um, revenue stream of this digitization project and has it had an impact? Um, thank you very much, Inda. We, uh, we, we've actually thought about, you know, uh, um, assets, you know, and, you know, the possibilities. But again, we're still at a stage where we haven't quite finalized on what we want the outcome to be. So I think it's from the outcome that we begin to think about possibilities of uh, streams of income, you know, where it's going to end up, you know, what's what's going to happen to it. Uh, I think invariably what we've done at this stage is the documentation aspect of things, which is to even collate, you know, the data. Uh, and we're now in the process of uh, processing the data to towards an outcome. So it's from the outcome that we can then begin to think about, you know, all the many possibilities. And also we have to realize, you know, that the technology is rapidly evolving. Uh, and also there's that element of uh, 
through the evolution process, you know, there are new opportunities coming up daily, you know. Uh, so again, it's kind of like what is uh, relevant yesterday may not be relevant, you know, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, you know, but the assets remain and then you can begin to think about the multiple ways to actually utilize the assets. Yeah. Well, Tana, I'm sorry, you can, I'll let you finish what you were alluding to just before you cut off. Okay, so I said, so. and the funny thing was that even though I, I offered them, they would get money. The artists were not interested in making money. <laughs> they were like, I don't, I, I, as long as you won't cheat us, as long as you're going to make sure our work gets seen and noticed by us, we're fine. And I was like, they said, we don't care about the money. And I, I was shocked to find out that they didn't care the money in the end, but they were just tired of being used because people would come and take their pictures of the assets and never come back. And they'll find the assets in on, online somewhere pictures online with no credit given to them just the credit was enough for them most creative people don't really look at money passion driven most of the time and it's a problem and it's also a blessing too because sometimes you have to forget money and just try and work you know even if you don't have money you have to put your passion try and get that job out so that was one part of it and another thing i found out was that because people didn't photogrammetry started so photogrammetry sounded very high level like it was something you do in nasa or mit i have to start teaching them that um, you can use your phone to capture images and turn it into 3D because over the past few years, as technology has evolved, there has been free softwares, our laptops have become stronger, phones have become stronger, you can now do this stuff because although they will not be on the same level with this equipment like Ms. Jumakedem used, you can get that training, you get the basic understanding. So in case a company hires you for photogrammetry, you don't come in like a novice. So I started doing trainings for two years, I started training people how to, um, the difference between photogrammetry and 3D scanning and why those two how they coexist. And I found out that a lot of other issues too going on, like um, how people thought um, the new art will, will replace the old artworks or artists, uh, artisans were relevant because of the new 3D software. And I was like, no, they're not mutually excuse, exclusive because if you're a modern artist and you don't know anything about your past or history, what are you making? You know, like I feel like art comes from you, your, your heritage, where it comes from. You know, I, I found 3D artists online that make stuff that impossible and they will tell you where it came from history time it has to have a reason it has to have a story why i'm making stuff so that's part, my platform and those trainings help most artists understand that to to be good artists in the future they have to understand a lot about their past and go and learn from professional artists some people went back to sculptors to learn real life experiences and compare with their 3d digital tools if why what and they found out why these tools were created because people study the whole old artists who were doing hard made works so it's been a learning journey for me because i'm self-taught I had to learn all these things myself and i like to help the next generation just jump all that hurdle i had to go through of learning the hard way so for me it's it's been a learning process all through thanks to china that's interesting that they didn't even yeah. they didn't <laughs> once yeah um, you. so and it you know it's funny that you say that about that group of people because um i feel that you know, with certain museums locally, they feel that when you digitize, it actually takes money away from them. Um, Pelu, have you found that? Because, you, you know, you spoke about the Museum of Traditional um, Nigerian Architecture. You know, why haven't they digitized? Is it because of that fear and things like, you know? Well, I mean, um, for, for the Motna, it's not a question of um, fear of income. It's just... Um, an administrative lapse, you know, on the part of the NCMM because it's a, it's a public facility. It belongs to the federal government, you know, under the management of the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. So for them, it's just a question of not getting their acts right and then seeing the value, you know, um, of Modna as it were. Because Modna alone could actually generate, I keep wondering why they would just allow it to just go bad. You know, Modna alone can generate so much money for the NCMM itself, okay? NCMM itself on an annual basis, on a monthly basis. So if you, if you, if you now visit and you are seeing it in such a dreadful state, mm -hmm. it just calls to question what it is they do with the budget, mm -hmm. right? And there are so many, I mean, there's just one mod now, but, I, but you can imagine so many other assets belonging to the NCMM nationwide. Nigeria has no less than 40 museums, national, 44, maybe at least 44 national museums. Each of those museums is in a terrible state. All of them are actually in the same state. You know, there is a beautiful museum in Enugu, a unity museum in Enugu. It's one of the richest museums I've ever been to, all right? The, the, the staff try to do the best they can to keep it going, 
but you will know that they will, they will be able to do better if they, were, if, if they had funding. So they don't have the funding. The one place that actually ties to the points that you've made about people not wanting their, their culture or their practice digitized is in Abeokuta. You know, you probably would know about the Adire, the Thai and Dai community in Abeokuta. You know, the first time I went to that place was in 2009 when I was traveling around the country. You know, and I got into, there are so many Thai and Dai compounds in Abeokuta. You know, so it's a whole community. And it's, it's, it's so painful that the state, okay, well, so if you want to take pictures of the Adire cloth, the finished product, you know, even or the process leading to the finished product, you will get a fight because the woman will tell you that it's actually, it's mostly women that do the, the, the thing. They will tell you, no, 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 you want to take our whatever, whatever to China or to Asia and then they will reproduce it and then we won't be able to, they'll be making the money off us. We are not making money, we are the ones doing the hard work. Okay, so that is one place where I found people very much opposed to, you know, digitizing their works or even having it photographed in one way or the other. But the one other thing that has actually gone to a great extent to damage that place is government wanting to advance too fast. You want to achieve development. You want to achieve a 25 year development in eight years. And so you, you go about destroying property. You go about destroying, you know, buildings and places that have been around for, for, for hundreds of years in the name of development. I think it's actually very short-sighted and stupid. Okay, so you will see that they've been, I mean, if you go to Abeokuta now in that community, in, in that community, but let me just put up my video. I'm not sure of my data now, my connection. So you go to that community, you will see that a chunk of it has been demolished to give way to a flyover or to give way to a, a funny looking, you know, modern Adirem, um, mall or something. You know, I wish that the, the drones had been able to get to all of those places. I, I wish that Jumokia and, and our crew People like her had been able to get to Abeokuta before they demolished all. It pains me so much to get to a place like that, close to the close to the you know um, to the Olumoro. That entire that entire complex, the Olumoro complex itself, and the Adire community can actually be a candidate for 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 for, for the World Heritage Site. But when you now go and be making development and stuff and destroying what has been there for for for, for hundreds of years, it, 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 we lose all of this. You know, we lose all of these advantages that we have. So you go to, I mean, you need to, I mean, I've, it, it gets, I'm so sorry. I mean, I get so very angry when I say this because I see them all the time and I'm powerless to do anything about it. I'm not in government. I'm just a researcher. I'm just a journalist trying to ensure that these things are not, you know, so you see that and then you see government also doing its own damage and places where, you know, that you, you need to preserve for, for the community themselves, for their generations of born, and then for the visitor who wants to come and study and see what they do. It's lost. And then you push them to one side, taking them to be irrelevant. They are more relevant than you in government, for God's sake. You know, so we have those challenges of individuals not seeing the vision and not seeing the advantages of digitizing. And then you see a government also not understanding that these things matter and they must be protected at all costs. Uh, I mean, it's very great that you mentioned that, uh, Pralumi. I actually, I went to that site uh, in 2015 Oh, sorry, 2014, um, uh, and that's the Adire uh, site. And as you said, you know, there was a bit of resistance, you know, but after a while, we were able to take some photographs, uh, you know, of the place, you know, just even the process of making Adire. Oh. But another interesting place that I've also been to is the Kofa Mata Dai Piet in Kanu, oh, yes. uh, which has been in existence for the last 500 years. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's also, you know, one site that I think that it's, it's, it's actually very, very important that we document that as soon as possible, yeah. uh, especially because of all the things going on across the world, because it's so, it's so relevant to uh, the history, you know, of, um, uh, 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 traditional, you know, yeah. tie and dye, you know, systems, you know, which they've maintained over 500 years, you know, so I think, you know, when you think about all of these things happening, uh, first of all, in terms of the government's attitude to culture, I think that's a starting point. But then again, I always think about it that the government is a representative of the people. So in a way, it's kind of like the general uh, um, reaction of people. Uh, the apathy that people have towards cultural, you know, heritage and towards culture, culture in general. I think that's the starting point. So when people come in, you know, there's this idea that, you know, uh, they, they, they think that the best way 
to, uh, to um, they can't sort of like distinguish between modernizing and westernizing. So there's always that, you know, push, you know, to transform, you know, indigenous practices, indigenous sites into sort of like this modern things that don't actually have any relevance to our context. So I'm thinking that rather than demolishing that place, for example, couldn't you have uh, preserved it? I mean, you have cultural uh, preservation organizations such as uh, Legacy, who they will be more than happy to actually work with preserving those buildings and turning that particular space into cultural sites. But again, it's also a function of the priority. So if the government looks at it that culture can be a revenue generating uh, um, uh, part you know, of our system, uh, an economic system, and think about ways to begin to actually look at it as, okay, so how do we achieve this? You know, okay, we want to invest X amount of this. We want to actually engage the experts. And through that, you can actually also, you, we speak about a lot of youth unemployment, but I think that even in the cultural sphere in itself, there's so many opportunities, uh, you know, that the youths in codes can actually become engaged and employed, you know, because if you want to do this preservation, you can uh, engage youths in that community to actually engage in the process of preservation. Uh, if you're thinking of also uh, tourists, you know, be they becoming tour guides, you know, when eventually that site actually becomes active, that's a way to actually engage the youth constructively. It's, they take ownership of the space, they were part of the process, it's very interesting, it will be very easy for them to then sell it to tourists. So I think our problem is actually the fact that we have moved away considerably from culture, our, our culture and tradition. And therefore, we're just moving around. It's almost like we're road less in a way, and we're not quite sure where we fit in. Uh, people travel, you know, they go to all of these places and they want to turn, you know, Nigeria to the Dubai. Why do you want to turn Nigeria to Dubai? Why don't you make, you know, what does that even mean, you know, when you think about it in the context of things? Why don't you think about creating uh, Olumo, you know, that other sort of societies can actually look at and also taking, you know, because the only thing we have to sell to the rest of the world is our identity and our identity is rooted in our culture. So if you think about it from that perspective, we think more about preserving our culture and exporting our culture to the rest of the world. I think that's the only way that we can actually make any substantial impact. And when you're thinking about the digital world right now, people are not thinking about uh, becoming stakeholders you know, within that space. And again, we're gonna be left behind. It's an opportunity for us to actually advance rapidly if we take the advantage and the benefit that the digital world is offering right now. In the extended reality space, everybody's learning at the same space. Nobody can claim uh, some sort of uh, superior knowledge over anybody from any part of the world. We're all learning as we go. It's very, uh, so, so this is a time for us to jump in, for government to begin to invest in extended reality labs across the, across the country and look for ways to actually begin to engage people to think, okay, we want to use extended reality to document our culture. We want these assets to be available that the world can actually begin to buy them because people need those assets. People that are researching, people that are producing uh, films and things like that, sometimes they just need uh, a, a cultural artifact uh, from Oshun Oshobo. They need an artifact, you know, specifically from Kanu, you know, they need an artifact, you know, from, uh, from, uh, from a Boma show or somewhere. And that in itself is uh, something that can actually generate revenue at the state, at the local government level, at the state level, and also at the federal level as well. So again, I think for me, the main aim is probably to think about the process of decentralizing government, because I think the challenge lies in the body of the government being at the center. If we a decentralized government, uh, and it's at the local, at uh, the state, at uh, the regional, then people can begin to think more, you know, about improving the individual local government states, you know, and things like that. And, and that in itself might actually have some sort of impact on, on development. So, uh, Oyinda, if you don't mind, let me just quickly add one or two comments to what uh, Jumoki has said. Um, um, talking about tanneries and leatherworks, the less well-known one that people really are not aware of is in Naraguta leatherworks somewhere in Jos. Is, is there, it's, um, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing, you know, cultural asset. It's the same leather works happening in, in Kano that you will see happening in the Naraguta town, you know, on the outskirts of Joss. And then speaking about what youths have done to champion heritage preservation. My one solid example will always be Badagri. You know, Badagri youths 
have been so wise to appreciate that they have this asset around them. And they've come together to champion those assets. They are not waiting for government, actually. They are coming together as collectives, as individuals. They are actually becoming, they are the tall guys, you, they are the local guys that you will find when you go to Badagri. Nowhere else in this country does that. And I would actually encourage many people, if you have young, if you know any, any young people anywhere in the country, we all need to look at Badagri as a model for what you should become in this country. You would, I mean, there, there's a, Badagri is an entire national monument itself. You know, the government isn't paying attention, but the youth understand that this is our heritage for us and for the future. And they've taken a special, a special care to say, you know what, let's come together and do this the little way we can. They don't have the money for it, but they try to do a, a bit of preservation, you know, as much as they can. And they are the ones who ensure that when you get to Badagri, you are not, you are not looking for who to take you around. They just take you up, take you around, they make you feel the town, and then you leave feeling very well, you know, um, enlightened about the history of slavery. So I just thought I should make that point before we move on. Thank you so much. So um, uh, we are actually approaching um, uh, just the end stages of today, but it's been really, really fascinating listening to everyone. Um, we had a question in the chat, so I thought we would go into that. Um, and I think it actually does, it may have already been answered in what was being said here, but um, Denja asked, in what ways can the government agencies oversee our cultural artifacts and tangible and intangible heritage, heritages by locally trained, uh, oh, sorry, be locally trained on digitizing those heritages and building the funding for such in their yearly budgets. So it feels like there are a couple of questions in one. So let's talk about maybe um, building budgets around um, digitization and maybe Frederica, you could speak to that. Yeah, it was very interesting to listen to uh, Jamoka and Pillu about uh, all this um, challenges. Um, my, my uh, opinion is always you should start with one first step and not think about the whole country or all the federal states and all everything which is uh, in the hands of NCMM. I think if you find one project where you also find people on the size of NCMM or other governmental uh, bodies who understand the, um, the advantages for them, just start with one model project and then this, if this works well, if it's really successful, I think then immediately all the others will come and say, oh, this is great. And now there's so much attention on, on, on your museum, on your site, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think also government, I mean, I, I don't believe it's always uh, here are the good guys, here are the bad guys, also among the, the, the bodies of the government and CMM. So you have people who really would like to do something. Maybe there's just a lack of finances, maybe also a lack of creative ideas. So I think really, if you, if you start that with one project where the finances is also not just talking about millions of, of, of uh, euros, dollars, or whatever. Make it, make it uh, small, find people on the side, just develop a plan together. And uh, because I know it, it's always in, in a lot of countries, the uh, governmental bodies always say, ah, uh, all this uh, artists, and so they are just having these crazy ideas. And the artists say, oh, in the government, they are only corrupt and ignorant people. So we have to find a way to work together. And if you start with one project, and this can maybe really be a, a, a blueprint for others, slowly, slowly. Yeah, I agree with you. I think we have to. Um find a way of communicating in the other person's language. Um, and yeah, it's step by step. Thank you all so much though. Truly, truly really was an, an, a really interesting conversation. I'm just gonna ask that maybe you can share um, your public profiles or your um, um, handles in the chat so that people can follow you and continue the conversation. Um, it's important to say that this conversation is part of um, the Nigeria gaming industry opportunities challenges and practices um, as part of enter africa lagos project which was supported by the goethe institute here in nigeria um, please do um, like and follow our pages and um, we're enter africa i believe ng um, uh, on instagram and um, we this is as, as i said this is part of a series so we have um 
previous editions that have taken place that you can catch up on as well on our platform. Um, and thank you so much, yeah, for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. I hope that it has been um, insightful. Um, and I will just say maybe a last ask for a closing maybe remark from each of our our speakers. Um, what do you want like as a takeaway for today's session on digitizing culture? So Kweli, as you're on the screen, go ahead. Okay, takeaways, right? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, I think my takeaway will be that, um, and this has never been in doubt, there, are, there is an army of Nigerians, you know, who are committed to, um, you know, preserving and protecting and propagating the Nigerian culture and heritage. Um, we just need for them to, to stay on track, you know, don't lose the fire. And then just like Frederica said, we have to take it bit by bit, not try to take everything all at once. I think that is actually for me, the one major thing that I'm taking away. Now, don't look at the entire country as a whole, just narrow down to one tiny little bit of, um, of asset and try to make the best of it, the best way you can. Thank you. Um, Uchenna? Uh, I, I think I'll just echo what Erika said too. It's the same. You have to start small. You, you, there will not be enough money to do anything in this life. So you just have to start small. If there's no funds. There's always a cheaper way. The world has moved. Um, democrat, everything is democratized now. There are free softwares for the paid version. There's 30 days trials. There are cheaper versions, there are, there are good phones, even techno phones can take good pictures for you to do photography. So if you have if you have if you're passionate about this space, you just have to start small, you know, and and, and hope that it, it lights a fire that, that that would bring that attention that gives you a chance to do something bigger with a bigger like um, platform. Thank you. And Frederica. Yeah, I mean, here in Nigeria, you're already very lucky that you have uh, such a huge group of uh, people working in the IT field. You have networks such as Enter Africa, so who, who really can start uh, pushing this kind of movements. Uh, so I think it's absolutely not helpless. I mean, you, you really the basics which you need to continue and all the projects like Jumokas. Uh, so you are not starting actually from zero. You are already, I would say, at step one, two, or three. So <laughs> be optimistic. Thank mm, you. Yeah, I agree with you. And Jumoke, last remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for the contributions. And thank you, Federica, for that. I think, uh, as, as uh, you have rightly pointed out, I think for us, you know, our approach was also uh, not to think first about funding uh, and also the possibilities, but to think about how we can leverage uh, on our capacities, you know, I think we, we started off with Judith and I. Uh, Judith is the founder of the MC 3 d and we're both very passionate, you know, about culture, about heritage, about preservation of that. Uh, and we both just leveraged, you know, on, our, first of all, our passion, and then also um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, like uh, our network as well, you know, what can be done, you know, if we connected with this person and that person and that person. And that in itself started off, you know, with first of all, thinking about building capacity. Uh, the second step also is about trying to then use that local capacity to then begin to actually actualize projects. You know, I think that way in itself. So we started off now with the Oshun Show. Well, currently we're working on another project now with LCCI. Uh, LCCI is Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, it's uh, like the second uh, oldest um, Commerce uh, and industry uh, 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 house of chamber, sorry, in Africa, uh, and they were also very much interested in in documenting, digitizing, and archiving, you know, uh, you know, the history, you know, and we're currently working on that right now. And we've also gotten, you know, like, you know, fillers since we did the Oshogo one for other people who are pretty much interested. But the challenge now is building local capacity, investing also because we're now, you know, at the time of uh, uncertainties with the coronavirus. Uh, you know, also thinking about partnership with SIAC, you know, would they be able to fly in uh, the possibilities of equipment? How do we acquire equipment locally because they're quite expensive? So I think those are the kind of conversations that we're kind of thinking about having now and also how to think about legislation as well. How can we bring archiving, you know, our record management into the curriculum? I think that's in itself would actually do a lot. You know, how do we begin to actually sensitize people in terms of, you know, their approach 
uh, to traditional, you know, practices, knowledge, you know, and all of that, you know, because I think it starts from that. If everybody, uh, in a way, embraces the culture. I think that in itself would set uh, some sort of ricochet effect, which would then translate to people saying, okay, I need to invest in this, or I need to support people with my knowledge. You know, I have a knowledge of background in IT, and I, I can actually donate that also. I mean, there was a, a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to a group uh, with their leader, is based, is a, is a doctor based uh, in, Dublin, uh, in the UK, and he was thinking about creating a language lab um, in Ijebu, is from Ijebu, uh, and he felt that, you know, slowly the dialect is, is in the next 10, 20 years, nobody would even remember the dialect. So I was thinking him and his group of, you know, friends, they were thinking of setting up a language lab, which is also a way to actually also preserve, you know, uh, the intangible aspect of culture as well. And so you have all of these type of people, things are happening and people are thinking about doing things in, within their own capacity. But I think there needs to be more networking as well, where people that are working, you know, in the cultural in the archiving space begin to network, you know, and talk about the possibilities as well as uh, uh, for uh, for building capacity and also, you know, for collaboration as well. I think that is the kind of conversation we need to have now. But for example, you have extensive knowledge, you know, based on your travels and things like that. So that can be utilized in terms of researching, you know, for some of those projects as well, you know, yeah. uh, and there's, there's that possibility of just making sure that we begin to build a team that we can actually replicate projects, because I think that's the thing as well. So once you do one, it's easier to do another and another, and then it just goes on and on and on, and people are building themselves through that process. So I think that's, that's actually where we are at this point. So big thank you to everyone. Thank you guys for joining us and for just such a dynamic discussion. Um, I think that, you know, for me, one of the key takeaways I, I would hope for um, um, our viewers is that, you know, digitizing culture, it's really at, in, at your fingertips, it's in your hands, um, that, that everybody has a role to play in the process. Um, you know, like uh, I think, um, was spoken about Jumoke is working with like really high tech equipment, you know, but Uchenna is saying, you know, you can do it with, you know, there's some basics that you can still do it with. So there, and, 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 you know, and Frederica is saying that, look, you're, we're not even starting at from scratch, you know, we already have an industry um, and exactly what you said, Pelu is there's knowledge here. So, you know, if you're taking on, if you're listening to what everyone's saying and you're, you know, getting in touch with our panelists, then, there is quite a lot of resources that you can um, really draw from. So I think that I'm hoping that um, it, it has been helpful for you. And I hope that there's takeaways um, that, you know, you can act on as well. So I'm looking forward to the digitization of um, our culture here. I'm looking forward to um, like Nigerian culture um, being put alongside um, other cultures, global cultures um, across the, the world. I'm looking forward to people accessing our culture. Um, and that's through everybody here putting their hand to the plow. Um, so, um, yeah, so I just say a big thank you to everybody. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.